Hi everyone, welcome to Page Makeup, module two from our Perfect Print Production series. In this module, we look at how each of the individual elements of your print job come together to create your finished artwork. And don't forget you can pause, go back or even break off and rerun the complete module at any time during this training session. Even before you brief your design agency or your graphic designer, there are already some big issues you might want to consider. And the very first of those being planning. Planning the overall dimensions of the job, planning the number of pages, and planning the number of colours to be printed. At this early stage, some careful planning here can deliver some big savings in both budget and schedule later on. Although it may seem obvious, finished product sizes of A4, A5, 3rd A4 and A6 are obviously more economical formats than perhaps some of the more creative product sizes that tend to stray away from these standards. After all, both paper and printing presses are designed to print these standard sizes for maximum economy of both the material and the printing machine itself. We don't want to be using more paper than we need, and we definitely want to keep press time to an absolute minimum. However, having said that, don't forget that your print suppliers will often have a few tricks up their sleeves with regard to how they can plan your job on their printing press. So if you are considering a finished product size that is something a little more creative than just another A4 brochure, starting with your print supplier is often a better place to begin than perhaps with your graphic designer. After all, it's your print supplier who really knows exactly what can and what can't be achieved on the printing press. And it's definitely your print supplier who will be able to advise you on which more creative finish sizes and folding formats can still be economic and cost effective. It's also worth noting that with more complex products, your print supplier will often want to send a working artwork layout guide to your graphic designer before they start just to make sure that all the specifications for page sizes, folding, glue areas, personalization, and any other critical measurements are taken into account. This doesn't usually cost anything, but makes absolutely sure that when the finished artwork is submitted to your print supplier, your job will fly through production without a hitch, on schedule and on budget. Yep, starting your project by consulting your print supplier first is a very smart move indeed. So, Having chosen our product format, the finish size, and consulted with our print supplier about how many colours we'll need to run on the printing press to achieve the brand and product matching we need, how does your artwork come together? Artwork for print is created using page makeup software, which creates a framework into which the individual elements of the job will either be created with that application or imported from another. Most of your graphic designers are likely to be using either one or both of the two big page layout applications used in the industry today, namely Quark Express and Adobe InDesign. Both of these very powerful and versatile page layout tools allow you to create and manipulate content to virtually any extent to achieve absolutely any kind of document or publication you could possibly imagine. So let's start looking at some of the elements of your job and we'll begin with picture images. You know, like most things in life, you get out what you put in, and the final printed quality of your picture images does not escape this rule. There are so many different sources of picture image, and it would be true to say that not all of them would be your first choice for an original to use in the printing process. For example, a colour photograph or any physical original that needs to be scanned to turn it into a digital format. Inevitably, this adds another quality variable into the process. Today, scanners are everywhere and incorporated into every sort of image capturing device, including, of course, phone apps. However, scanning an image for high quality print output is still a great skill in itself. And if you're looking for a really high quality image capture, scanning is a process perhaps still best undertaken by your print supplier on a high-end professional scanner. Worse still, and thankfully only very occasionally, you might find that your original is actually a previously printed copy of the image itself. This, of course, is now only an illusion of the original image, created on paper by the interaction of four little dots of ink, the cyan, the magenta, the yellow and the black. The four standard printing colours, and although far from ideal, this may be the only available original of the required image. Very often in print production, you get what you get. 
With this type of pre-printed original, what you're being asked to do here is to match four new dots of ink with four existing dots of ink already in the printed picture to, in effect, create an illusion from an illusion. What you might now get is something that perhaps should really have looked like this, but actually now looks more like this. The chances of exactly matching the four existing dots with four new printing dots is pretty much zero. And if you're really unlucky, the assortment of poor quality images just keeps on coming. From images that have been screen grabbed from the internet to poor quality JPEGs taken with low end cameras in far from perfect lighting conditions. So if all that's what we don't want, what are our preferred originals for high quality print? Well, of course, what we're really looking for is a high resolution, high quality image file saved in the correct file format for the job. So let's take a look at the issue of resolution first. When we're talking about digital images, we're also talking about pixels, the little building blocks of data that create the illusion of your digital image on screen. And resolution has become the generic term which describes the density of those pixels in a given area. Because the density of pixels can have such a dramatic effect on the success of your printed image, it's a good thing to have a working knowledge of this issue. We talk about high resolution and low resolution. Generally, more pixels are better than fewer pixels, as you get a higher density of image, giving smoother tones and ultimately a more convincing illusion. To meet our expectations of a high quality printed image, we therefore need to ensure our graphic designers are supplying high resolution image files to our print suppliers. So how many pixels is high resolution? How many pixels do you need to ensure a great looking picture? Well, to understand this, we need to know that there are three different types of resolution. The first, which we've already identified, is PPI, pixels per inch. This is the resolution at which input and display devices operate. Your digital camera captures images in PPI. Your scanner captures images by scanning in rows of pixels, and we display, view, and edit digital images on screen in pixels. Your graphic designers, therefore, are supplying a high-resolution artwork file to your print suppliers in PPI, pixels per inch. The second type of resolution is known as DPI, standing for dots per inch, and refers to the dots at the printers on the printed page, which today is pretty much the only place you do actually see dots, the dots which will create the actual illusion of the printed image on the paper. Everything else is just pixels. The third type of resolution, known as LPI, lines per inch, also refers to those dots at the printers, on the printed sheet. In the first Perfect Print Production module, The Printing Process, we looked at how creating the illusion of a printed image works by screening the original photograph into a printable image made up of a whole load of dots. This printable screened image is called a halftone, and it's the density of this screening that we're talking about when we discuss LPI, the lines per inch. This time we're referring to the number of rows of dots in the halftone, which we call the printer's screen ruling. So, in answer to the question, how many pixels is high resolution? As a general rule, any image that you want to print on a printing press should have an original resolution, that's the artwork resolution from your graphic designer measured in PPI, pixels per inch, of at least double the printer's screen ruling, measured in lines per inch, or LPI. So for example, a typical piece of marketing print may be printed at a halftone screen of say 175 LPI, lines per inch, which is pretty standard and common LPI for this kind of work. So therefore the high resolution artwork image file will need to be at least double that at 350 PPI, 350 pixels per inch, which again is pretty standard for this type of work. So how can you know what your print supplier's LPI screen ruling is? Simple, call and ask them. And knowing the printing process that they're using and the smoothness of the material that you're printing on, they'll be able to tell you straight away. Having said all that, if your graphic designers are always supplying high-res files at between 350 and 400 pixels per inch, you won't go far wrong. For the majority of your jobs, that will deliver sufficient data to create a great-looking image. 
So if that's high resolution taken care of, when do we need to talk low resolution? Well, of course, the more resolution we have, the larger the file size will be. And for the internet, or any digital multimedia environment, file sizes are absolutely critical for speed of transfer. The internet operates at a resolution of just 72 pixels per inch, which looks great on an RGB screen, but is absolutely no good whatsoever for print production, where a much higher density file is needed of around 350 pixels per inch. If we were to try and use a low-resolution image from the web for high-quality print production, it would look something like this, simply not enough pixels in the file to create a quality image. So, low-resolution 72 pixels per inch files are mostly used on the web, but we do also use them in the print production process for displaying images for identification purposes and for positional guides in the artwork layout, simply to save computer processing time and speed things up. One last point about resolution that's always fascinated me. If there are clear differences between PPI, DPI and LPI, which we've just established that there are, why does everyone in the industry seem to speak generically only about dots per inch? And the answer has to be because DPI has over the years become standard generic terminology to describe all types of resolution. And you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. OK, so what about the images themselves? There are principally two types of image. There are vector images and there are bitmap, or as they're often known, raster images. Let's look at bitmap images first. A bitmap, or raster image, is one that's made up of a matrix of pixels, each one of which is assigned its own colour value to create the illusion of a photograph on screen. However, there is something really worth knowing about this type of image, and it's this. Because the bitmap image is made up of a fixed number of pixels, if you enlarge the image, the pixels simply get bigger. And at a certain point, you can see them making the image appear blocky, with jagged edges instead of smooth lines, an appearance we call pixelated. This effect therefore makes bitmap images what we call resolution dependent, meaning just that, bitmap images are only as good as the number of pixels they're made up of, in relation to the size you need the image to be printed. Photoshop from Adobe is the world standard bitmap editing application used by almost all graphic designers and anyone involved in image manipulation the world over. And one of the many impressive things it can do is to increase the resolution of an existing image. It's a function called interpolation. However, increasing the number of pixels does not always increase the amount of image detail proportionally and can leave the final image looking a bit blurred. There are, however, a number of very clever specialist plugin applications which will increase your resolution while keeping blurring to an absolute minimum, but these are still far from a perfect solution. Otherwise, the answer is simple. To make sure you always achieve the highest quality image, a bitmap image needs to be captured and saved at the correct resolution, which is most likely to be 350 pixels per inch, and to the actual finished size that it will appear in the publication. So, what do we need to know about the other type of image, the vector image? Vector images are typically logos, sketches, graphics, illustrations, and pretty much anything else you could class as a drawn object within your job. A vector image or vector graphic is created not with pixels in a grid like a bitmap, but instead with mathematical points joined up by smooth lines and curves, creating an image that is, this time, completely resolution independent. What this means is that, unlike a bitmap, you can resize a vector image as much as you like without any detriment to the quality whatsoever, from an image on a mobile phone right up to a billboard. The two best known drawing applications for this type of image are Adobe Illustrator and Corel Draw. So, we now know that your print job is made up of vector-based text and line work created using page layout applications such as Quark Express and InDesign, into which placed or imported images are incorporated, which are either vector images for graphics and illustrations, created using applications such as Adobe Illustrator or Corel Draw, and bitmaps for your photographic images, mostly manipulated using Adobe Photoshop. 
But before we go any further, let's focus a little more on those imported or placed images. All images following their initial capture by a camera or by a scanner or following any amount of editing need to be saved and they need to be saved in some kind of digital format a format that will be supported and recognized by your page layout software and ultimately by your print suppliers output device so each and every image whether it's a bitmap or a vector needs to be saved in a file format and there are quite a few to choose from so let's take a look at a few of the most commonly used file formats, starting with the one everyone seems to have a love-hate relationship with, and that's JPEG. JPEG gets its name from the committee who created it, called the Joint Photographic Expert Group. With JPEG, they created a file format that can compress a file into a fraction of its original size, in fact to a tenth of its original size. This, of course, is fantastic for an internet and RGB multimedia environment where small file sizes are critical, particularly when even after compression, JPEGs still look great on screen. And that's exactly what JPEG was designed for, and that's exactly what it does best. And with the more recent version, JPEG 2000, it now does it even better. In fact, today, most image capture devices, such as cameras, give you a JPEG as a default image format. All of this is fine, of course, until we need to use a JPEG for print. The problem being, the file compression works by removing data. In an RGB low-resolution environment like the Internet, we don't miss this data. But in printing, where we need a high-density image file to achieve a quality image, we really do. JPEG is what's known as a lossy format, referring to the amount of data that it sheds during compression. And if we allow it to, each time a JPEG is edited and resaved, it will compress still further. If we're not careful, what you can end up with is, annoyingly, still a very good image on screen, but comparatively only a bag of dust to give to your printer. This is a common problem with poor, low-density JPEG images. They still look great on screen and often therefore raise the expectation of the print buying client to an unrealistic level, only to have their expectations dashed by a very disappointing printed result. So what's the answer? We obviously have to use JPEGs and often JPEGs are all we get. The answer is to try and work with your graphic designers to ensure that all the JPEGs being used in your print job have each been saved as lossless, and so will retain their data integrity. So, if a JPEG is first saved from its original capture as a lossless file, and at a high resolution, you shouldn't have any problems with the resulting printed quality whatsoever. The second of the most common file formats has to be a TIFF, the Tagged Image File Format. This is an absolute favourite with graphic designers and printers alike, and for good reason. A TIFF uses lossless compression, meaning an image which is saved as a TIFF can be edited and resaved without losing any image quality. It really is the first choice for high-density bitmap images for print. EPS is another very common file format and equally popular in print production. The encapsulated postscript format is another favourite with graphic design for print and particularly for saving high-resolution vector files such as logos, illustrations and graphics, although you can still use it for bitmaps too. Many graphic designers still prefer to send vector files to print suppliers as native files. In Adobe Illustrator, these are known as AI files, which ensure that absolutely all the data created in the program is transferred, maintaining absolute integrity of the original artwork and allowing the file to be easily edited later on. I think it's also worth mentioning here that you do need to have a vector editing program installed on your machine to be able to open an EPS. And part of the problem in sending a native file is just that. Your print supplier needs to have exactly the same application installed on their system to be able to open it. And to maintain the output integrity of the artwork, ideally they should also have the same software in the same version and be using the same fonts from the same manufacturer using the same operating system. What are the chances of that? And you can see what's happening here. 
The responsibility for the integrity of the artwork file is being pushed ever more onto the graphic designer. Today, from colour separation to file formats, graphic designers have to become increasingly savvy about the production process, which previously would be the responsibility of the print suppliers themselves. So not surprisingly, when supplying native files, problems such as missing high-resolution images and incompatible fonts causing text to reflow or be substituted by other printer default fonts have been commonplace. Supplying the actual fonts that you use to create the artwork to your print supplier for them to use as printer fonts does help, but not everyone is happy to send fonts, and not every supplier is happy to receive them due to some title issues surrounding this practice, all of which makes the case for, and brings us neatly to, PDF. The fantastic portable document format which, as long as you have downloaded the free reader software, can be opened and viewed and output on absolutely anything. Since the early 1990s, the PDF format from Adobe has completely revolutionised the print production workflow and has become the world industry standard for the distribution of brochures and technical manuals. A PDF is a completely self-contained document into which we can save and embed all of the page elements including fonts, images and even hyperlinks. Not only is it cross-platform, so a PDF can be created and viewed on Macs and PCs, but it is also completely device independent, meaning it can be output on absolutely anything. PDF is completely independent of application software, hardware and operating systems. Most artwork for print is now sent by PDF, created with Adobe Acrobat. Firstly, from the graphic designer to the client for on-screen approval, we discuss screen proofing issues in our proofing module later in this series, and secondly, the PDF is sent to the printer for production. We all use PDF in some form or another every day of our working lives. And we're all now completely familiar with printing files to PDF simply by clicking on the Adobe icon. However, it's important to know that there is a very real difference between the kind of PDF that we might create in our office environment for publication on the internet or for output to an internal printer, as compared with a PDF that is specifically created for a high quality professional output at your print suppliers. In fact, so much so that only a PDF that has been skillfully created for the print production process and to a printer's exact PDF creation settings can be properly described as print ready. To encourage the correct submission of all artwork files, including PDFs, many professional print suppliers publish their exact specifications and requirements for artwork on their websites and only PDFs which have been expertly created to work with the printing process and only those which adhere exactly to those specifications are likely to live up to the expectations of the graphic designer and the print buying client. So having created your page layout and placed your bitmap and vector images, we're now ready to send our native or our PDF file to our print suppliers. But before we click send, it would be good to quickly re-examine all the elements of your job and make absolutely sure that everything is good to go, that all our artwork really is print ready. After all, although any errors can always be corrected later on by your graphic designer or your print supplier, this comes with a cost to both budget and schedule and assumes that the problem will actually be discovered in the first place and not find its way through the entire workflow and down to the printed sheet. In many cases where corrections to artwork are required, print suppliers are always more than happy to oblige, particularly if the schedule is tight and they have a native file to work on. However, these corrections can come at a cost, and if you have a separate contract with your print supplier and your graphic designer, you will most likely receive those costs added to your invoice. If the error was found to be down to your graphic designer, it will then be down to you to negotiate these extra costs with them. So, how do we check that each element in your artwork across the whole publication is prepared correctly? Well, both your graphic designers and your print suppliers check it with pre-flighting software, which undertakes an audit and diagnostic of your whole job. 
pre-flighting software alerts you to every aspect of the job that it feels might require another look. For example, images which are below the required resolution, colours that may not be achievable from the standard four-colour set, fonts and images that may be missing, page numbers which may be positioned too close to a trim edge. In fact, everything and anything that might prevent your artwork from outputting correctly. Most page layout software like Quark Express and InDesign incorporate pre-flighting software of their own. But there are, of course, other specialist applications like FlightCheck from Marksware, which work with all the popular publishing programs. And there you have it. From creating your page layout to confidently sending great print-ready files to your suppliers, that's how your artwork comes together. If you have any questions about any of the subjects covered in this module, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Thank you for choosing us today, and good luck with all of your print productions. You've been watching a John Boardman Performance Learning Module. See you again very soon.